Welcome to the first episode of Daphne 2 Presents The Pod. Today we talk with actor Bjorn Thorstad, who played Shaggy. It's a fun episode, so stay tuned. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, Bjorn. How are you? No problem. My pleasure. I'm so happy to be here, Tiger. Um, uh, I'm good, thanks. We're, we're doing all right over here. You want to start out by uh, introducing yourself for anyone who's not familiar with you? Sure. So um, for the, you know, two or three people who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Bjorn Thorstad. Um, I'm an actor in New York City, and I was a part of the uh, uh, the inaugural, the first national tour of Scooby-Doo and Stage Fright live on stage, which I think is the occasion for this. Uh, for yes. This I'm, I'm very excited to hear about this. You know, I was trying to find information online and you're the only actor I could find that was in the show. Like, I couldn't <laughs> find a cast list, a full cast list anywhere. Um, that's hard to believe because there's so many people who are worth mentioning. Um, so, uh, so that's a shame. Uh, there's some real heavy hitters actually and uh, we can talk about them later, but yes. um, uh, I, I can't account for that. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I, I looked it up too. As it, it was perfect for the interview, I was like, "How did they get a hold of me? And uh, <laughs> and, and where where's the um, where's the evidence?" And apparently, there is a, a a note on Wikipedia. So I'm like I'm like a footnote in the in the Scooby Doo uh, yep. Wikipedia page. I love it on the uh, Scooby Doo um, uh, Scoobypedia website under cast list. You're the only cast member listed. <laughs> oh, weird. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> How did you get this role? So it was a regular audition. Um, uh, I would say like any other, except that it was for Scooby-Doo. So it was a big, you know, it was a big deal. You're joining this legacy of uh, American, you know, folk television. Um, and at this point, it's like 50 years old, right? So Yeah, 52. We just had the anniversary a few days ago. Insane. So uh, my agent called and said, um, uh, do you... Uh, do you do impressions? I was like, yeah, I do, I do, I do a few. He said, do you, can you do the voice of Shaggy? And as a kid, I had, you know, I made a, a game of imitating various personalities and voices on television and that sort of thing as, as a lot of us do. And I tried the Shaggy voice as a kid and I just gave up. I was like, no, nope, I can't do that, that's too hard. But um, you put a steady paycheck behind it and um, it changes the uh, equation, so. Uh, so when he asked if I could do the, um, the voice of Shaggy, uh, the answer was, of course, yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Anything you need. <laughs> and I had three days to, to live up to my promise. So, um, three days later I went in and auditioned and I, uh, uh, sat next to Emily Fletcher, who, um, was actually auditioning for something else at the time. There was another show down the hall. And Amy Schechter, the casting director, came out, saw Emily, and said, uh, you're here for Scooby-Doo, right? <laughs> she, no, I, I'm here for, you know, the musical down the hall, whatever. And she said, no, no, you need to come with me. <laughs> because if you look up Emily Fletcher, and your listeners can, uh, you'll see that she, and to this day, looks exactly like Daphne from the cartoon. I mean, oh, she's wow. Like, it's incredible. So, so she um, ended up being Daphne. Yeah, yeah. So we, she and I made friends at the callback, mm -hmm. um, which was like an hour or two process. They were pulling us in and pairing us up and you know we weren't sure who was gonna get it yet. And there were a couple of choices for each character um, uh, still at, waiting out in the hall. And um, we actually got the call uh, right around 9-11. Oh, wow. So it was, it was like September, uh, end of August, early September that we were auditioning and um, Emily and I got in, in touch with each other after the callback and neither one of us wanted to admit that we got it in case the other one didn't. So we were like, really, so I, I forget who was like, who said what, but it was like, did you get it? Or, I don't know, did you get it? Did you? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, me too, okay, phew, we both got it, but are we gonna, is it gonna happen now? Because we, you know, the world was coming to an end. Right, right. Nobody was sure what was happening. You were, it happened in New York City at the time, the auditions? Right, that's right. The auditions were late uh, summer of 2001. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So uh, what was the story of this show exactly? Do you remember the uh, storyline? Yes. So Jim Milan, who was one of the writers, uh, the main writer and the director, um, got together with a team in Halifax and they penned out this script that was, uh, you know, that was based on the formula because every Scooby-Doo show is the same, right? Yeah, it's it like, follows the f basic formula, yeah. <laughs> right, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So right. it's like, they followed the exact same formula and in uh, Scooby-Doo Live on Stage, the conceit is Daphne is going to visit her uncle, okay. who is the film director on the set of his new spooky horror film, which has been plagued by accidents and thefts and mishaps. And so when the gang shows up, um, he's in a, he's, he's in a state. He's, the, the movie is, is barely holding itself together and, and he needs the gang to help them solve the mystery of, uh, 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 of the, um, the missing prop. Because one of the props has gone missing and it's this, <laughs> it, it, it's this expensive like set of diamonds that's on loan oh. that the lead actress is supposed to wear and and they're called the devil's diamonds and they've been stolen so the, oh. the mystery ensues from there what was the uh, the monster of the show so you think the monster of course is the red herring character mr crawley who was played by uh two very talented comedians um in our two production, as I, I did the first and second national tours, and the the show went on to have like international legs in the UK a couple times and South America a few times. And my buddy Pierre uh, Pierre Marc DNA, who played Scooby oh. in the first national tour and part of the second national tour, or joined us for the second national, um, went on to do it like for years after. Oh wow! And um, and blew his knees out, but. Um, <laughs> He went really in on being the dog. <laughs> he did, yeah. So, um, the what? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, I'm, oh, we got so far. Um, who was the monster? Who was the monster? Right. So, so you think it's the red herring character, Mr. Crawley, who was played by Andy Patterson, and Andy's this amazing like talent. He's an incredible classical actor. He um, he was he was playing you know the old the old pantalone character from Scooby Doo. He's like, oh, I would have gotten away with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that guy who was like the caretaker he was like the you know the janitor of the set or whatever and the, um and the and then in this at the second half of the first national uh a good friend of mine dan fogler took over the okay. the, the uh dan fogler of the of the now harry potter franchise uh yeah that uh, name sounds familiar so, so he uh he joined us for the second half of the first national as mr crawley which is a, a track that was played you know, where the actor played a bunch of different characters. But um, so you think it's Mr. Crawley, but it turns out that the Devil's Diamonds were actually stole by the very actress mm. who wore them in the film and from whom they were stolen. And it was like- Of course. Her and her, was it her and her father, I think. Oh, I think, I think, oh, so it was a red herring, red herring. So you think Mr. Crawley did it. And then you realize that the, that the actress stole her own diamonds. Mm -hmm. But she did it in cahoots with her father, who was Mr. Crawley. So it's oh, Mr. oh, it was a double, Crawley. double twist. <laughs> yes, yes, so it was a double twist. So how many years did you do this show for? The better part of two. So we started in wow. uh, late 2001. We did uh, seven months. We hit like um, 25 cities in seven months wow. with week long sit downs in each city, and then. Um, we were on hiatus for uh, for a bit, a half a year, and then we went on the second national for four months, and they dropped us off in Los Angeles. So we we wound up uh, uh, just doing a four month tour the second time around. Um, we played Radio City, we played the Fox in St. Louis, we played the what was then the Kodak Theater in Los Angeles, and everything in between. All these wow. giant Broadway roadhouses. It was a lot of fun. That must have been quite a time. You were all over the country. Yeah. Did yeah. you get to experience the cities? Uh, definitely. I mean, we got a week in each city and, um, you know, we were doing quite a bit of press, which got us up at five in the morning, but our shows weren't until, you know, seven at night. So, uh, yeah, we had plenty of time to, to run around and, you know, see the, um, 
the Andy Warhol Museum in, uh, in Pittsburgh and the, uh, we got to see the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh. Uh, we throw out a couple first pitches here and there at some of the <laughs> oh, some wow. baseball games. And, um, Were you dressed yeah. up as a uh, Shaggy for those pitches? Um, I actually let my understudy uh, the, or the swing throw out the first pitch because he was a huge baseball fan and I just am not so <laughs> I was like this is gonna mean a lot more to the you know <laughs> to, to my who was college. your understudy I'm uh, sorry I uh, interrupted you <laughs> no that's all right um a guy named Jeff Statil okay. uh, a huge baseball fan he just he's a he's a doctor now okay <laughs> quite a journey yeah yeah but he's a great guy and and a, and a huge baseball fan so but I, I can imagine you got close with people. Very close. In fact, um, my two Scoobies, Pierre and Dave Droxler, another very talented actor who's now a, a voice for a bunch of characters on a few Nickelodeon shows. Okay. Um, Dave and Pierre and I continue to be really good friends. And actually, um, Pierre uh, Scooby mm -hmm. and uh, Liz Pierce, who was the, the the actress, right? The lead actress who who wound up being the villain in the end. With the diamond, up, yep. Right, right. They wound up getting married. Oh wow! Did they meet on the production? They they met on the production, but we were all on the road, and we were two or three months in when they realized that when Pierre was a kid in London, he was at like uh, some international school in London. It's like middle school or high school or something. Um, he went to a production in the West End in which Liz was performing. So he had actually seen her as like a seven-year-old kid in the West wow. End as an audience member watching her on stage. And they and then they finally met and, and fell in love on the on the show. They didn't get together until uh, a year or two later, but um, maybe it was more than that. Maybe it was a few more, few years, but they eventually did. Wow, that's that's, a, that's quite a lifelong story. Oh man crazy right we just had him over the other night for drinks <laughs> oh wow yeah that was my next question are you still close with these uh people you worked with very close very close um emily fletcher who uh uh was daphne mm -hmm. went on to um live her broadway dreams she oh, wow. played all the you know in 42nd street and uh chitty chitty bang bang and uh she did you know the she did a stint in Moscow, but she was doing, she, she realized her dreams of being a Broadway baby by the time she was in her late twenties. And, and she was like, now what? <laughs> and the answer to that question was uh, to become an industry leader, leader in uh, uh, meditation. Oh, wow. So she's got this like international um, uh, organization that it leads, uh, uh, teaches people how to meditate. And um, it's like 10 years strong now. And she's uh she's she's written a book and she's spoken in front of google and she's been on good morning america she's like she's got a whole new chapter in her life. wow that's quite a, a daphne like story right there you know yeah right and the reason i know that is because she wasn't just my daphne she's also my guru <laughs> wow oh man so you you really got spiritual help from her as well yeah yeah, yeah. wow that's so cool um who was vilma so uh vilma was played by a couple of actors. Um, Randy Rosenholtz was in the second national tour. And uh, Joyce, her name is now Baldwin. Joyce Baldwin. That's her name now. Um, she, was, she was hilarious. Um, and she was like in the national tour of Greece. Oh, wow. Um, uh, along with Greg Cunine, who was our Fred. Mm -hmm. uh, the two of them did Greece together. So anyway. Can, yeah. can you do a, a Shaggy impression for us? Of course, it's been a while, so you'll have to forgive <laughs> me. But uh, yeah, um, after doing it every day for the better part of two years, <laughs> what, what, what would you like Shaggy to say? Just uh, give me give me anything. Well, give me a line from the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God, this is like an actor's nightmare because... <laughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. The actor's nightmare is that you're, you're like, your, your show is like reopening like today. And you have to <laughs> the role that you did 20 years ago and you, can't, you have no idea. Just Tell give me a good you. zoinks. What were the lines? Zoinks! Like, like, look out, Scoob! Oh, like, wow. What I wouldn't give for a ham sandwich. 
<laughs> that is that is spot on. Did you have a particular Shaggy you took inspiration from? Definitely. Um, obviously, Casey Kasem is the OG. Right. Um, so if you're not if you're not centering your uh, your vocal performance around uh, Casey Kasem's characterization, you're you're not really doing yourself any favors because uh -huh. that's the expectation, right? Like everybody who came after is standing on the shoulder of that giant, you know? Mm -hmm. So whether it was me or Matthew Lillard or Scott Innes or, you know, uh, any of the other the handful of guys who've done it, um, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's signature and it's so expected mm -hmm. that if you deviate, it's, it's going to be a disappointment, I think. So yeah. it was, it was a real, that was one of the demands of the job, you know, the other demand being it's a cartoon and you've got to recreate it in a live format. So how do you defy the laws of physics or seem to anyway, mm -hmm. right? Cause that's another, where they do that thing where they like jump up in the air and they, <laughs> they run for like three seconds without going anywhere. And then they- Did you do that in the play? Well, that was like the, that was the spirit of the physicality that I wanted to capture. So it was all about like, how do you, you know, the, the problem was how do you, you can't like jump up in the air. Right. And do, like, so, so how do you make it look like, how do you make it feel like you're doing that? And so all of the, all of the physicality, all of the running around was, 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 was never going to get to that point, but that was always the, that was that always was the, the energy, that was always the vision and the energy. Yeah, exactly. So what were rehearsals like on this? Um, for the first national, we were making it up as we went along. I mean, um, Jim and the writing team had, uh, ha had planned out some jokes and some physical bits, mm -hmm. but the mechanics of how they were gonna work were not all re realized on the page necessarily, and, and uh, nor need they have been. Mm -hmm. So they would send us off into the separate room, you know, me and Pierre, and we would work with a movement coach, uh, this amazing um, uh, choreographer, Jen Rapp, and, and we came up with um, a lot of the bits and just sort of figured out how they were going to work. Like, what, it, what are the demands of gravity when the, when the problem is Scooby has to leap into your arms while you're doing a pirouette, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make that work? And if you can't make the joke on the page work, what do you do instead? So there was a lot of like creative problem solving and improvisation. That's that's really interesting. Like you really had to develop the play while you were rehearsing. Very much so. Yeah. I'm, I'm you know, not too many of the lines needed to change, but mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the bits did. Some of the, a lot of them had to be cut. Some of them had to be changed, um, you know, and for better and for worse, like if you we were spending two hours trying to get a sandwich to blow in the wind and it was just taking up too much time, you know, to, to get all the parts to come together. It was a very, it was like a ballet where the actors and the set had to work together. Mm -hmm. And we, we had one scene that was literally called the door ballet where we had a one ton door drop that came down with six doors and it was that classic <laughs> French farce. You know, but okay, yeah. People they're they're running in and out of one door, running yep, out one the doorway door. gag. Oh, I'm so happy you guys had that. <laughs> Absolutely, and then at one point, Scooby's head appears around the corner of one door, way over on stage left. You know, and then 50 yards stage right, his tail pokes out the you know the, the <laughs> door on the other end of the stage, and they're like, Oh, that's so that. cool. So. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of choreograph choreography and. 60% of the choreography was backstage and just trying to get the, the mechanics of it right. But it was so much fun. It was so rigorous. It was such an incredible um, uh, workout. It was like 90 <laughs> minutes of yoga on crack. It was just, it was wow. so difficult. We would come off stage and we'd be absolutely dripping in sweat. And, you know, I can imagine the, Pierre, especially. Oh, yeah, I was just about to say Pierre. So Pierre's in like three layers of unitard, right? One of them is like a bodysuit. And then over that is sculpted, beautiful sculpt, sculpted foam by Yvette Studios, who did the Lion King. And then over that is this oh, layer, wow. this layer of felt. So he looked beautiful. But then the kids would like run down the aisle to try to 
you know, pet him. <laughs> put a hand in a pool of sweat. It would just be oh like. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So did you actually catch him? Was there actually a part where you had to catch him? Yes. Yes. I mean, was, I mean, we had to catch each other repeatedly. It was just nothing. It was constantly scrambling up and down each other, ducking under tables, around corners, uh, running and screaming. I and mean, it was just, it was insane. I, I was, uh, I was in the best shape of my life. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was crazy. Be becoming a cartoon, very physical. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a classic Scooby gag where um, Daphne holds the entire gang. Did anything like that happen? <laughs> no, that would have been amazing, though. No. Uh, that would have been amazing. But that probably would have taken the whole budget of the show. To like <laughs> <laughs> so did you have any uh, other roles in the production of the show besides uh, Shaggy? Yeah, I mean, doing all the press, like being the the face of the press originally they were planning on having the press duties divided equally among the cast you know mm -hmm. they didn't want to have to overburden any one cast member but you know everybody's favorites are shaggy and scooby and you okay. know everybody wants to see the dog and if you have the dog you have to have the man and so and um and we just got good at it i mean we got good at like playing around with the newscasters and you know, <laughs> the, the radio personalities and um, I suppose the, you know, the voices of Shaggy and Scooby are the most distinct of the, mm -hmm. of the gang. And so to hearing them on, they play better on radio. So, so Pierre and I, and um, Amir Arison, who voiced uh, Scooby, okay. uh, uh, along with Clayton Dean Smith, they took turns voicing Scooby, uh, wound up doing a lot of the press. And yeah, because Scooby was voiced by another actor off stage. And I didn't even realize. That's hilarious. I, yeah, that's I I I take that for granted, but that's <laughs> it's always sort of a, a novel thing for people to to find out because they right. they assume that the voice is coming from the same actor in the suit, and it's not. The actor in the suit is just a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. But we so we want yeah. So the role was was being the the press guy, and you know we'd go and do these interviews all day, and so they You'd had be to be in character. Them. In character, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, but it, it was fun. We we had fun with it. It was like it just uh, it was morning at the improv. <laughs> you know, one of the shows we were in Salt Lake City, and we did this this show called Good Things Utah, and it's like the six a.m. Good morning, you know, local Good Morning, oh, show morning like a cooking segment or whatever, and they would throw Shaggy and Scooby into the mix. You know, it's like <laughs> jambalaya with Shaggy and Scooby. You know? <laughs> oh, I I would love to see that. Oh my goodness. I'm sure there's a clip of it somewhere. Oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it if there is. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's probably on VHS, so you'll have to convert. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so was there any big food gags? Like, what food did you have to eat as Shaggy? Um, there was uh, a buffet table in one scene, of course. There's always got to be a food gag. So, and the, there was a plate of spaghetti mm -hmm. that was like a mountain and then we would grab either ends of it, Scooby and I, and we would slurp the spaghetti until the and the mound would slowly sink and sink and sink until it was flat. Okay. And what else was there? There was a big there was a big pot of like something with dry ice in it. And <laughs> um, what was one of the we had that sandwich gag? I really wish we could have got that to work. It was we're, we're we're like riding up in the back of the mystery machine. The mystery machine had to. Had like a sunroof in it. Our mystery machine did. It mm -hmm. had a sunroof, and so we were standing up. And um, they actually had a vintage 1969 Dodge van that they cut in half, and they took about a foot or two out of it to shrink to shorten it on stage, and then took the gas engine out, put an electric engine in, and they drove the thing around on stage. It was an actual, oh wow! It was an actual vintage van from the period. Um, that sounds like a big thing oh my goodness yeah it was insane and then uh we were we were supposed to be eating trying to eat this many layered sandwich in the back of the van but because we were standing up and it was outside the wind was blowing the sandwich layer so a slice of cheese would fly and then a ham and then a and okay then a, and then an olive or whatever but we couldn't 
it, it, and, and the way it was supposed to work was on a fishing line and there was somebody off stage who was like trying to reel the sandwich <laughs> in. We spent so much rehearsal time trying to get it to work that eventually we just had to let it go, but it would have been a cool bit. So there were no sandwiches in the final show? There were sandwiches, but it's, I think we were like gonna take a bite of one and then, and then the specter came up, the spooky specter came up behind us and scared us before we got a chance to or something. It was. <laughs> so it was, what uh, was it like working with uh, the director, Jim? What is, what's he like? Great, Jim is great. Um, you know, he comes from the, uh, the kids in the hall. Mm -hmm. He's there, uh, the director for all their tours. And um, so he's a, a comedy scientist and working with somebody who uh, thinks like a scientist and, and, and is precision oriented when it comes to comedy and takes comedy very seriously was my jam. I mean, I grew up uh, loving the kids in the hall. There was a, right, that's a classic. There was a VHS tape of uh, a bunch of different episodes that made its way around my entire high school class. <laughs> um, and my best friends and I would just watch it over and over and over again. So, you know, getting to work with Jim and Mark McKinney, who was a story editor on the, on, on Scooby-Doo was like a dream come true. I mean, it, it didn't get any better than that for me. So like, it was, it wasn't just doing like this silly cartoon show for me it was like you know it, it was realizing a childhood or a, a young you know a young dream of mine very that's, early on that's amazing wow yeah. and and jim was i mean jim's great he's a he's a comic genius he just he he's super relaxed and groovy he's super chill he like he's he's very punk rock like when he was doing theater in toronto he was like you know very rebellious so he had this countercultural edge to him that was <laughs> very appealing to a young 20 something cast of actors and um and he's just a super decent awesome guy that's cool that's good you got seems like you got to work with a lot of good people yeah yeah i did oh, and it was all about sorry. the people yeah it was all about the people incredible people it started from the top down <laughs> do you have any more uh stories from rehearsals or from the road that you want to share uh, <laughs> there was a story that I was not allowed to tell, oh. uh, according to general management. I told it, I, I, I mentioned it to one um, reporter who was doing like, you know, pre, pre, uh, before the pre-press or whatever, before the press goes, come, before the show comes into town, they were doing advanced, pre advanced press, that's what I meant. And I got in trouble for, uh, for, for telling this story, but I don't suppose it matters anymore because I'm not representing <laughs> Warner Brothers. Twenty years or, later, yeah. <laughs> or Clear Channel, or I'm, I'm not, you know, like, like for the record, I'm 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 not uh, I'm not affiliated anymore. So I think I might be off the hook. But um, we had this uh, amazing props mistress, Anne Marie uh, Rodeva, I think is her last name. Mm -hmm. and she was just like this awesome, like super cool. Uh, uh, technician who wound up making it like the, the spaghetti thing. She was the one who operated the spaghetti under the table. She made, oh. and I think she solved a lot of those props problems. So she was that the, the props. complicated, yeah. Yeah, she had a big job. And, um, and she was just awesome. And, but one night, and I, I wanna say it was at the Wang Center in Boston. She, um, she cut a fart under the table that we had to subsequently dive under. And it was so unbelievably stinky that when I went <laughs> the other side of the table to like, you go, you go under the table and then you poke your head out from underneath the table mat or the place, whatever, the tablecloth. Uh -huh. uh, I forgot my line. I was so traumatized by the smell. I was like, oh my God, what do I say next? <laughs> and I, like, I peek my head back under the tablecloth and I look at her and she's got this shit eaten grin on her face <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny and i can't remember my line but i'm like i might and and the microphone picked up the fart <laughs> <laughs> like people heard it and they're and they're laughing and i don't know if they're laughing because i'm laughing right <laughs> they're laughing because they heard the fart <laughs> but the next line and i couldn't believe this i was like i can't believe this. i forgot my line and the next line which is supposed to be in reference to the big pot of, you know, whatever's bu bubbling at the other end of the table is, would you smell that? 
Oh, the irony. <laughs> so well, that show, that joke was funnier than any other show. <laughs> it was meant to be, yes. That joke was like clearly of the gods. Like the gods had ordained that that joke had to be in. <laughs> Wow. But so, but I got her back a couple of weeks later. I think <laughs> where we were like, or Cleveland or wherever we were. Like, I got her back. It was under the table. Oh no! <laughs> and, I, and I was holding one in. And I let it rip under there to to. Uh, that is actually such a Scooby and Shaggy moment. They're always it's kind of gross, but they're always making fart jokes. You know. So can we talk? Is it okay for me to ask you questions? Yeah, of course, please. Tiger, what is your, like, what, what is your, um, uh, where does your love of Scooby come from? Oh, man, it's, it's deep. Um, the community, I think, is what really keeps me in love with Scooby-Doo. Like, I, I love Scooby-Doo as a kid, right? And I sort of fell off when I was maybe 10 or 12 years old. And as a teenager, I discovered this website, uh, ScoobyAddicts.com. It had a forum with a bunch of people that all love Scooby-Doo. And I sort of was like, wait, Scooby-Doo is still happening? <laughs> so it, that at the time as a teenager, I got back into Scooby-Doo through this website. And then now, you know, 10 years later as an adult, Instagram has a huge Scooby community. So once I discovered all the people on there, I got back into Scooby-Doo I'm like okay it's still going again you know every time I'm like surprised a little bit because I fall off for a long time so then it's always the community that brings me back because it's such a a huge diverse group of people from all walks of life all over the world it's yeah. really insane how worldwide the Scooby fandom is it's beautiful it's incredible isn't it what do you think you, what I mean so the, the community is incredible but what about the show do you think uh inspired the initial draw like why do you think people are so drawn to scooby is it because it can't just be because other people are drawn to it can it, it, <laughs> it has to be, i mean i mean that's a huge part of it because it, right. it does sort of bring a it has a great demographic like you have to be you know a good-hearted person i think to be <laughs> into scooby-doo and and passionate about it so what but what do you think it is about the the series itself i think yeah that's a good point it it is very it's a good-hearted show you know, the characters in it have good hearts. Each one is different enough that somebody could find a character in the show that they relate to. Like, um, the characters are sort of blank slates in a way, even though they have their own personalities. They're just generic enough for somebody could feel like Fred, somebody could feel like Daphne, or like, I could feel like Shaggy, you know? You find a character you love and you get attached to them and you, there's so much of them and everything is 52 years, their personalities are very consistent. Uh, so it's like having a friend who you can always count on. You could always count on Scooby-Doo to be a good dog and to make you laugh and to have a wholesome show. And it's a little predictable, like the, I'll say the most recent series, uh, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, you know, it very much follows the formula every episode to a T and it's, getting predictable but it's still fun even after 52 years it's still enjoyable even though like you know there's going to be the door gag every episode or something it's still fun to see 52 years later it'd be weird if it weren't predictable right i mean right. that's got to be part of the success because mm -hmm. look at shows like uh you know all the all the dick wolf properties like svu right mm -hmm. i mean svu is like what are they in their 23rd season now right and it's it's this every show mm -hmm. is the same formula i mean it's a different exactly it's, it's about having that formula it's a different current event they tackle and and the writing is incredible but but the form the formula has got to be key to the success right just, and I, I, I i'm maybe that's a subject for another episode like what's what's the uh what's that perfect formula that Scooby what is it about the formula that makes us so that makes us that keeps us coming back mm -hmm. As you said before, like even when they were writing the play, they followed that exact formula and had to adapt it to stage. Even even 20 years ago, when the show was only 30 years old, it's still the formula was, has been established for a long time. So not a lot of people know this. Some of the some of the dorkier, nerdier folks will, but I think it's worth mentioning, and it's definitely uh, my way into Scooby Doo because I was not always a fan. Okay. I guess, 
as a kid, I was like, I watched it, but I wasn't like, I, I, I preferred other cartoons. Mm. But do you know Eddie Izzard and his- I love Eddie Izzard. Um, the Riches is one of my all time favorite TV series. I'm still mad at FX for canceling it. <laughs> right, I know, like great series. Have you seen uh, Dress to Kill? Love of course, Riches. yeah. Oh. So you remember his little segment in Dress to Kill about Scooby and Shaggy, right? I, I can't say I remember. I was probably 13 years old the last time I watched it. If, there's a YouTube clip of Eddie, okay. and it's him talking about the appeal of Shaggy and Scooby and how okay. there are, you know, they're cowards who are always hungry and eating. And he's like, and, and, and he's, they're loved the world over. And what is it about them? And he said, well, what other characters from literature do we know who are, are like that? He says Falstaff from, from Shakespeare uh and and a character from james joyce and he's like so it's like and shaggy and scooby is like that level of greatness you know he's like he, he's and, tracing the lineage of their character traits that's really interesting yes but it goes back even further than eddie mentions um to commedia dell'arte okay so when i started studying the com the, the cartoons for the uh, for the audition Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, how do they stand? How do they walk? How do they carry? How do you, how, you know, it's like, oh my God, they're all, they're standing in the first posi position. They're doing these ballet moves. They're doing these sort of classical, like Fred and Daphne lead with the chest and Shaggy and Scooby, you know, they, are, they have these, you know, sort of floppy zanny moves. So mm -hmm. it turns out that every one of the characters on Scooby-Doo are based on Commedia dell'arte characters, right? You've oh. got... Daphne and Fred, who are the lovers, right? The, the ingenues. And you've got uh, Velma, who's il dottore. She's like the, you know, the pedant, the, uh, the, the, the studious and intelligent one. And then you've got Shaggy and Scooby, who are the Zanny characters, who are always getting the best of their masters, right? And they're always either hungry or scared, or they've got some, you know, fatal flaw that makes them super hilarious. And then the bad guys are always the pantalone characters, the old men with the big nose and the... Right. <laughs> so they're like, they're drawn right out of this Italian tradition from the 15th wow. to 18th centuries that, you know, the through line for which you can trace through vaudeville, through sitcoms, through cartoons. So putting, when I realized that it wasn't just doing a silly cartoon, it was actually returning a comedic tradition back to the medium where it began it had oh, this it makes so much sense yeah lovely full circle aspect to it that was just uh too exciting to resist <laughs> did your uh cast members share that sentiment at the time i don't know i don't think i ever talked about it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was my own private little <laughs> bit of you know i, I would i would i would have lost friends if i tried to <laughs> uh, too too nerdy for the rest of the time. <laughs> like you're a nerd get out of here we're like we're just doing a show shut up and have fun uh, what got you into acting my elementary school friend seth who lived up the street from me asked me if i wanted to audition for the show that his dad was directing in downtown roar colorado mm -hmm. um at this old uh army munitions factory it was army, army munitions warehouse that had been converted into a theater in the mid-century uh uh and then converted from a theater in, or from a movie theater into a, a live theater so um it was called the roar fox art center his dad was directing oliver twist a oh. play version of oliver mm -hmm. and um uh and so that was that was it. I started. I was like nine years old. I said, "Sure, I'll, sure, I'll go do the play that you and your dad." And and then it became like a, an activity, after school activity, like any other. You know, we'd go to soccer practice, baseball practice, and then um, and then play practice. And and play practice was the thing that kind of stuck. So you just uh, went went on from there. You stayed stuck with acting. Yeah, I I, I started when I was nine, and I never stopped. I just kept wow. doing it. Um, locally in uh, the community theaters, semi-professional theaters of the Denver metro area. And then uh, when I was 16, I got an agent, started taking it seriously in high school, and then told my parents, um, broke the news to my parents really that I wanted to major in it in college. They were like, what if you minored in it instead? And I was like, no, no. Right, like, Is that a major? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so 
they the god bless them they they paid for a conservatory education wow and that's, um, that's very unique <laughs> yeah it's like it, it's super super privileged like I, and and it, it it becomes a it has been a bit of a problem that like the only people who wind up getting to be actors are, are sort of filtered through this very expensive system mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of rules out the possibility of others. And there are people who come through the cracks, slip through the cracks, like, mm -hmm. for instance, T.R. Knight, who was a series regular on um, uh, that uh, on Grey's Anatomy, uh, okay. never went to a, a performing school or whatever, but obviously it didn't matter. Now he's a huge movie star. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, but the system by and large has been very like uh exclusive and and a, li and a bit out of reach to people who couldn't afford these sort of you know elite bfa and mfa programs um i i think that might be changing now i mean the yale school of drama just uh it, which is now the david geffen school of drama is now okay. free to oh, mfa wow. students and uh and others because uh, David Geffen gave this huge gift, so he's paying basically everybody's tuition. So there's a move to like balance that inequity. Uh, but it's something that I realized lately. I was like, oh my god, I really there was I just took for granted this huge privilege that not a lot of people got to enjoy. Well, that's good that you're aware of your privilege. At least that's the first step. <laughs> <laughs> right, awareness. Right is the first step. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what acting school did you go to? Boston University. Okay. They have a um, an arts school there uh, where they have like a sculpture program, visual arts and uh, an opera program uh, called the College of Fine Arts. Uh, what brought you to New York? Um, it was a choice between New York and Chicago. Um, I, I wanted to do theater um, and theater in Chicago had a, had a great reputation and theater in New York is where you go when you, you know, um, uh, when, when you go all the way. So I decided to go to the city, even though it was scarier in New York, I decided to go to the city where you could go all the way. What was your first uh, big production? That was it. Really? Yeah, Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo no, was my, your big break. My first co professional contract. Out of, oh, out of wow. Uh, Where did you go after Scooby Doo? Into the uh, the regions. So there's this like circuit of regional theaters mm -hmm. around the country that um, still do a, a classical repertoire, mm -hmm. Moliere and Shakespeare, and then they yeah. tend to mix their seasons with more contemporary mm -hmm. plays, things that have appeared on and off Broadway the season before. They'll do out in the regional theaters. It's called the Lord Theaters, League of Regional Theaters around the country that most class A, B, and C cities have them. What are some uh, recent projects or upcoming projects you've got? Um, so I took it, I, I mean, everybody's taken time off from theater because of COVID. Right. Least. Um, and I actually stepped away from theater four years ago to focus on uh to focus on television but um i have been traveling lately and that's uh, nice and yeah and that's that's had most of my attention um how did i do recently <laughs> last, thing I did, uh, last thing i did was three seasons at the um uh, uh alabama shakespeare festival okay uh, but then you know everything shut down because of covid so mm -hmm where um, theater is just now getting back into the swing of things. What, uh, what TV have you done? Um, I was a recurring character on Law & Order SVU. Okay. Um, I had a, a, a part in an episode of uh, The Nick. Oh, uh, I actually, I like that show. I gotta look out for you. <laughs> it, it's episode six. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and um, it was crazy because Steven Soderbergh was like, holding the camera like crouched down in the corner like right <laughs> right over my left shoulder and um i had researched for that role months in advance because i was like oh my god i work with steven soderbergh i've got to like know my shit <laughs> character was a memento mori photographer mm -hmm. um and back in the early part of the 20th century 
it was not uncommon for people to take pictures of their loved ones posthumously right after they died. Mm -hmm. And um, that's actually a trend that's coming back lately since the aughts, the early aughts. Okay. But it went away after, you know, around the time of the Titanic, it, started, it ceased to be fashionable <laughs> and it stayed unfashionable for decades. And then and now it made this resurgence, but I was like, what the hell is like, who, that, like there was a guy who's like a memento mori photographer where you go into hospitals and you take pictures of dead children. And there's this whole like industry, cottage industry of that. Wow. And the things you don't expect people to, you know, have. <laughs> The things you learn as an actor, like there's right. just it's the best education because you have no idea what's going on in the world until you have to play a role. Then you know everything about it. But um, there happened to be this museum uh, uh, gallery exhibit of memento mori photography from the early part of the 20th century. Uh, oh, I went wow. and checked that out. And uh, I actually got a hold of a, mem a memento mori photographer in Boston. She was the area coordinator for memento mori photographers in the greater Boston area. So she would like pair photographers with a hospital say or or a, a, a grieving family and um and I was like walk me through your day like what what, what you know from the moment you step foot in the door what is going on for you because like how, how do you even begin to imagine what it's like to be a momentum photographer with right, that that's a, a unique like you gotta look at dead bodies all the time I can't even imagine right and and it's got to be normal and it's got to be like you know it's got to be normal it's got to be routine for you so by the time I got on set um I was like I knew more about what was going on in that moment than anybody because it was a scene about a you know a dead baby being photographed and like so like I don't know who else re researched that but the thought the, the guy who's playing the father was like should I, should I look at the camera do I look at you <laughs> And I knew the answers to those questions because I, I looked at enough pictures. I was like, oh, well, actually, you, I, you know. You had all their answers. Soderberg, if I may. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, besides uh, acting and uh, Scooby-Doo, do you have any other passions or hobbies? I play the piano yeah. privately. Um, nobody's ever heard that. Maybe three <laughs> oh. or four people. Um, and uh, and I study I study languages, so I work regularly with a French and Polish tutor. Oh, that's interesting. It's it's fun to you know know lots of languages. I'm always trying to learn uh, Japanese. I'm still still trying to learn after ten years. <laughs> yeah. What um, what what got you into Japanese? Uh, you know, I guess I'm I'm a nerd to you know anime, video games, lots of uh, video games only released in Japanese. I would love to be able to play, but oh, nice, okay, it's gonna be a long time. <laughs> are you, what do you are you Duolingoing or what? What's your every? I say every year I do a good month straight of Duolingo, and then I fall off, and I have to restart. You know, or um, memorize. I find memorize to be very uh, effective. But Better my than problem is I fall off and I have to restart every time, you know? I, it, you know, I, something's got to stick though, like, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you come, you, you don't forget everything, do you? I do, honestly. Everything? I'm bad. <laughs> I'm bad. I, I, can, you, I can read Korean, but I can't tell you what it's saying. I, I remember the alphabet. I've done wait, that what? enough times. <laughs> so you know how to pronounce it, but you don't know what it means? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I got my own problems there. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's got, it's like a habit, right? Like if you, it's just, it's like going to the gym. It's easy to, it's easy to fall off the bandwagon, but. Right. But when you're worthy, on it, you're on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But a worthy pursuit. Mm -hmm. That, so that, that's really cool. You're into languages. How, uh, are you fluent in them? Um, not in Polish, uh, but I'm almost fluent in French. I mean, I can carry on a conversation and I could live in France and within two weeks I'd be fluent, but I need the immersion component. Mm -hmm. When I lived there for even just a week, I had studied for six years and and I started to dream in French after about day 10. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's when I knew, but um, 
but uh, so really the the tutoring is just to sort is upkeep. Yeah, keep I would it, need keep yourself from losing it. Yeah, I would need to go and actually immerse and have a reason to speak every day, and that would be I think I would achieve fluency in French pretty quickly, but Polish would take a while longer. I only studied started Polish two years ago. Okay. Interesting. What got you to do Polish? I'm sorry we're going so off topic, but it, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, love. Nice. Simple. <laughs> love it. I, I fell for a Polish national. <laughs> ah, nice. That's beautiful. So, uh, do you have a favorite Scooby-Doo series? Um, I was afraid you were going to ask that. I, <laughs> I haven't actually seen... Um, Besides the original vintage cartoons, I haven't actually seen a full episode episode of, of any of the more recent ones. And I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen any of the movies all the way through either. Oh, wow. Um, I remember watching part of the, the original Scooby-Doo live actions with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who was in, it was like uh, Freddie Prince Jr. And um, Matt Matthew Lillard, Lillard yeah. Uh, and um, who played Velma? I said, a wonderful actress who's Linda Cardellini. Linda Cardellini, who's had an yeah. incredible career. Um, she uh, she was great. So, but I just I kind of wanted to see. I was like, oh, how are they? How does it translate to live action? I just wanted to see. And I was curious how Matt was going to play were, the role. Um, before them, right? Because the, the movie came out in two thousand two, so you were technically yeah. the first live action Shaggy, which is really interesting. Gosh, now that you mentioned it, I might actually be. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's crazy. That's a fun distinction. Right. Yeah, that's um you get to you get to keep that title forever. <laughs> right. no, nobody can take that from me. <laughs> so uh did you watch a lot of Scooby Doo coming up to the play, uh, preparing for the role or anything? Yes. Oh yeah. A ton of Scooby yes, watch the cartoons uh religiously and studied. <laughs> studied all the movements because I just I, I, I needed a I needed a vocabulary of physicality so um, wanted to get you know a dozen or so recognizable uh, physical gestures recognizable traits the classic walk the slouch it's like how do the arms move like and um, it just, it became, you know, Shaggy was my Hamlet. So I was like, I, there, I couldn't go too deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you became Shaggy, but you couldn't become Shaggy. Uh, I don't know. I think there was a bit of a meld. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think Shaggy became me and I became Shaggy. <laughs> Do you feel like it's left a lasting impact on you being Shaggy? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was a graduate education in comedy and it was a graduate education in Commedia dell'arte, frankly. I mean, it was like, and, and, and an education in performing in venues that size. Like we rehearsed for months uh, in Times Square in a, in a big, big studio. And so we calibrated our performances for the size of the studio. But then when we opened in Louisville, all of a sudden there are 2000 people and the space is like 10 times as big and yeah. so the performance that you'd calibrated for the studio has now has to play this grand hall. And I was mortified within the first scene or two of the first previews in Louisville to find that my performance was not sufficient. It was just not, making the cut it wasn't hitting the back row mm. it was barely holding the attention of people beyond rows 15 mm. and 16 you know what i mean like you can tell when you have them and we didn't have them mm. and it was just the it, it was the sheer size of the of the theater and and the wow. um you know 2000 seats was like the smallest houses we were playing maybe maybe 1200 was the smallest but we were playing upwards of three four thousand seats radio cities a six thousand seat house wow and they were packed and we were at 70 percent capacity or better wow. so uh you know so all of a sudden you well what what do i do i'm in the middle of a show 
and and my performance is inadequate mm -hmm. and I've been rehearsing for this this for a month and this is all I have so we just had to adjust on the fly we just I, we just had to go oh well we have you know and I think there were a couple conversations in the wings mm -hmm. right after the first scene it's like it's not working it's not working <laughs> but that was two cities before Radio City right Which we were living on one that we went, we went Louisville, Atlanta, and then I think we went to New York. So New York was like a third. We wanted to open in a couple different places before we played the big time. By the time we got to New York, we had figured it out. And then all of a sudden, so like a gesture like this, you know, in Louisville became this. <laughs> it, was like, it had to be a lot bigger. It had yeah. to hit the back row. It had to hit the back row. It was just, yeah. It was, but it was a, it were fun problems to solve. You know, how do you, how do you calibrate to the different size space? But it's, that's the, that's the joy of live performance, you know, that. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me on today's show. It's really been an honor to have you here. Thanks for the trip down memory lane. Um, what's your uh, website and ads so everybody can find you? Um, it's my name, Bjorn Thorstad. So if you Google me, everything comes up. All um, right. The, the Instagram. Uh, thanks a lot, Tiger. I'm a, and I, I gotta go and, and check out this, the scoobyaddicts.com. Is, is the yep. podcast a part of that or are they not affiliated? I'm, I'm, uh, I'd say I'm close friends with her now. Uh, Nikki right. runs scoobyaddicts.com. She's been on a few episodes of my show if you check back my uh, one year anniversary special i had her on and we also did a live q a interview a while back oh awesome <laughs> well thank so, you so much for coming on i really appreciate it you're really you're really awesome so <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, that goes both ways i feel like i gotta ask you though before we go like which of the characters which of the gang did you identify with most I'm Shaggy. Yeah, I feel like you were gonna say that. <laughs> I'm the the stereotypical stoner Shaggy. You know. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Me too, man. Me too at heart. Hey, yeah. it's really a pleasure to meet you, brother. Thank you so Likewise. much for coming on today. Likewise, Tiger. Have a good night. Thank you Thank for you joining man. Daphne Two Presents. Oh, could you give me a Daphne Two Presents in the Shaggy voice? Like, thanks for joining Daphne Two Presents. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the inaugural episode of Daphne 2 Presents The Pod. I want to once again thank Bjorn Thorstad for coming on the episode and give a shout out to Richard the Red for providing the background music and at Scooby News on Instagram for providing the poster cover art. Make sure you check them both out. This has been your host, Tiger Singh. Tune in every Friday for a new episode of Daphne 2 Presents The Pod. And follow Scooby-Doo Daphne 2 on Instagram for daily Scooby-Doo content and live Q&As. Have a great day. I've been having bad, bad dreams. Now I can't seem to fall asleep at night. Oh, how could you? I've been having bad, bad dreams